Today, we're going to look at the question, why do diabetics experience so many cases of amputations? And what can you do to avoid this? On today's program, we're going to look at why diabetics get things cut off, things like toes, feet, and legs. Of course, what I'm talking about is a procedure known as an amputation. Amputations have been performed by surgeons for a long time. Essentially, an amputation is done when a doctor decides your toe or your foot or leg is a severe risk to your health and life, and you would be better off without it. My mother had both her legs amputated above the knee, and she was a diabetic. I'm going to be sharing quite a bit of her story and some pictures and video clips about her in this video to put a face and a life story on this terrible scourge. And then I'll talk to you about what you can do in your own life to keep yourself from going this same route. The fact is, if you are diabetic, you are far more likely to need an amputation at some point in your life than a non-diabetic. After looking at my mother's life as an example, I'll answer the question, why do diabetics need amputations so much? And then we'll look at the number one method by which you can protect yourself against it. And let me say this, many of you who have been helped by the videos I make about diabetes owe a debt of gratitude to my mom. Her life and her struggles provided tremendous motivation for me to beat diabetes and not end up going down that same road she traveled in the last years of her life. And by her motivating me, I've been able to motivate some of you. Recently, I went down memory lane and dug up some old pictures and some video clips of my mother, and I want to share them with you and talk a little bit about her situation. Mom grew up in a small town called Louisiana. That's not the state, it's a little town called Louisiana in the state of Missouri. She was young, healthy, and pretty when she married my dad. She wasn't thinking about diabetes then. She was, like everybody else in those days, thinking about a looming war with Germany and Japan, one that we called World War II. Mom's first evidence that she had metabolic syndrome, the fountain of diabetes, was not high blood sugar numbers, but high blood pressure. Mom's blood pressure became high during her, the decade of her 50s, and the doctors had to pile one medication on top of another to try to control it. At one point, she was up to five different medications for her blood pressure. Often, her upper number, even with the medications, was in the 170s. Eventually, her blood sugar rose as well, and by the age of 60, she was a diabetic. By her mid-60s, she had developed pain in her legs and often could only walk short distances before she was forced to stop because of that pain. Why is it people experience pain in their legs when walking? It has to do with circulation and blood flow. There's a Bible verse that says the life of the flesh is in the blood, and there's a lot of truth to that. It is our healing, life-giving flow of blood throughout our bodies that keeps our cells oxygenized and healthy, and if that blood flow is ever compromised or somehow reduced, we are in trouble. Many years ago, when I was having serious blood sugar issues, I had a strange experience. I fell asleep in my recliner with my hands folded under my head, kind of like this. I doubt if I slept more than 20 minutes, but when I woke up, my arms felt totally dead. They were numb with virtually no feeling in them at all. Now, we've all had arms and feet that fell asleep, as we say, but this was more than that. My arms were so numb and lifeless, it was odd and a little scary. They did come to life after a bit, but I was freaked out. I began having this kind of thing happening fairly often, and I realized that my circulation had been significantly diminished. Welcome to the world of diabetes. There are two primary reasons why diabetics need amputations. The main reason is due to blisters, sores, and ulcers that will not heal. Our bodies are wonderfully made with the ability to heal themselves of all kinds of wounds and sores and cuts and so forth. And normally, that's exactly what happens. But when our circulation is weak, we don't heal very fast, and sometimes we just don't heal at all. 
Often a diabetic will get an ulcer or sore on his or her foot and it will decay and become infected and then get worse and worse. While for a normal person, that sore or ulcer would get better and better over time, for the diabetic, with their blood thickened by super high blood sugar levels, healing simply does not happen and eventually the doctor tells them that that toe or foot or leg will have to be amputated. The first step in this process is neuropathy. If you have diabetic neuropathy, a feeling of pain or numbness in your feet and toes, you've begun stage one in the eventual amputation of your foot or leg. doesn't mean there'll always be an amputation, but you are in the first stage. Now, there is another reason for diabetic amputations, and this is the one that cost my mom her legs. This has to do with a condition known as PAD. On the Mayo Foundation's website, they write, Peripheral artery disease is a common circulatory problem in which narrowed arteries reduce blood flow to your limbs. When you develop peripheral artery disease, PAD, your legs or arms, usually your legs, don't receive enough blood flow to keep up with demand. This may cause symptoms such as leg pain when walking. And that, of course, was exactly the case with my mom. Peripheral artery disease is likely to be a result of hardened arteries in the legs with blockages. But whether you're talking about ulcers that will not heal or the PAD, the ultimate perpetrator and bad guy in both cases is poor circulation, which is ultimately caused by blood sugar that runs way too high all day long. In mom's case, she developed pain in her legs in her mid-60s. She didn't have that pain when she was sitting still, but when she walked, it quickly appeared. She put up with it for a while, but finally went to the doctor, and the doctor realized she had blockages in the arteries of her legs, and he performed something called an angioplasty. It worked for a while, and then the pain returned. He then performed a bypass surgery to create better blood flow in her leg, and that too worked for a while, and then it didn't, and on and on it went. By the time mom had her first amputation, she had endured five bypass operations on her right leg and five on her left leg, always with the same results. They worked for perhaps nine months or a year, and then the pain returned. We didn't keep records of the dates of mom's surgeries and procedures back then, but by the dates on a video I made during mom's second amputation, we can ascertain that she had her first amputation at the age of 74. It went well and resolved the problem of pain in that leg. Mom was fitted for a prosthetic leg and managed to get around pretty well. Here's a picture of her cooking at the stove with her walker. And here's a video clip of her entering the house after being out with my sister, Linda. But within two years, her other leg was hurting her terribly. The Avenger.com blog states that around 55% of diabetics who have one leg amputated will need the other leg amputated within two to three years, and that was the case with mom. One day the pain in her remaining leg was so intense they had to take her to the hospital in an ambulance and it was quickly decided she must have this leg amputated. Sadly, after that second amputation, the leg did not heal well and they had to bring her back into the hospital for yet another amputation, this time higher up on the leg. Here's a video I took of mom as our family visited her in the hospital. Good. The doctor talks like I'm doing all right. I hope so. He said that they might take the stitches up. I mean, close up the stitches. I believe he said Saturday. Friday they'd right. take the stitches up and take the stitches out. As I listened to her, I can tell you that her speech was slightly slurred, which, as I recall, lasted until her death. She had had two strokes right around the time of the amputation of her second leg, and possibly a few other smaller ones at other times. Several years ago, I interviewed my sister Linda about this ordeal that our mother went through. My family was living in Texas at that time, but Linda was living with mom and had first-hand knowledge of everything mom was enduring. Here are a couple of things she shared. 
Okay, there was two years between the amputations. So the remaining leg uh, served her for another couple years, and she would had a prosthetic made, mm -hmm. and uh, she walked okay with that. Yeah, and a she, walker. I remember she, she learned to around. walk with that and yes, did pretty well. She got around. Um, I remember the day that she took a delivery of the prosthesis. I never saw our mother cry the way she did. When it came in the, what, it came in the mail or somebody no, brought it? No, she or? was the first day that she was fitted for oh, it she was and came for home. It. Okay. I think that was such a hard reality to look down at this hardware. Yes. That's on the lower part of your body. And I, I think she cried all day and all night. Wow. But she, like you said, she was not a crying person. And, and the they doctor can't do any more bypass surgeries on the remainder remaining leg. So he tells her, we're going to have to cut that one off as well. That's right. How did she take that? Pretty bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she became very uh, depressed, anxious. But at the second leg, uh, she had woke up from a nap that day at home with tremendous pain because I was talking to her from my work. And uh, so we hung up and Next thing you know, Dad was calling me at work saying that an ambulance was coming for Mom, that the pain was so unbearable. She was in tremendous pain. Yes. When they put her in the ambulance, they put her on morphine. Here's a picture of Mom who had come down to Texas with my sister to be there for our daughter's graduation. I snapped this picture of Mom and Linda in May 1998. Neither she nor I had any idea that within a couple of weeks she would be dead, and Linda told me that on the morning before they took her to the hospital that final time, her blood glucose was around 500 milligrams per deciliter. Now, Mom did live to be 80, but in those last 16 years of her life, she was constantly going to the hospital and constantly having to deal with pain in her legs. Walkers and eventually wheelchairs were her constant companions. Her doctor had told her to reduce the fat in her diet, eat healthy carbs, and watch her sugar, the standard advice in those days, and sadly, in many cases, it's still being given to diabetics. And oh yeah, be sure and take your meds. It clearly did not work for her and has rarely worked for anyone. And that's why diabetes is considered by most as simply unbeatable. Do what you can to slow its pace down a little bit, but you will surely get worse and worse, which of course is what happened with my mom. Running around through life with sky-high blood sugar levels is slow motion suicide. You are killing yourself one meal at a time as you eat your bowls of breakfast cereals and load your dinner plate with rice, mashed potatoes, and huge pieces of bread, and then enjoy your dessert of French silk pie or cake and ice cream. Your weight goes up, your blood pressure goes through the roof, and your glucose follows close behind. Strangely, even though my dad ate the same foods as my mom, he was never diabetic and lived to be 87 without any major health problems until about the last six months of his life. Even while in his 80s, his doctor told him he had the blood pressure of a teenager. Of course, dad ate small portions of food, and he was always slim. And then there was this. He also never snacked. Never snacked. Never. Oh. And mother, that's mother loved to snack. Yeah. I cannot blame my mom for eating as she did. She was simply doing what nearly everybody was saying diabetics should do. But today, however, there is a sizable group of doctors, nutritionists, and even ministers like me who are saying, stop. The emperor has no clothes on. There is a better way. The simple antidote for all this misery is to bring your glucose levels down to normal. That means an A1C in the fives and fasting glucose around 100 or lower. The truth is that carbohydrates drive high blood sugar. It's not fats or proteins, it's carbs. If you slash the carbs, you cannot help but lower your glucose levels. Now, there may be a gap of time you'll have to wait before you see the results, but if your patient and if you follow the right diet, you will see it. And it's thrilling to watch your glucose go to, from the 300s down into the 200s, then down into the 100s, 
And finally, you know you've reached the promised land when you wake up in the morning, test your blood sugar, and discover it's 96 or 92, or amazingly, 84. God is good. And with lower blood sugar, guess what happens? Your blood becomes thinner and less syrupy and starts to flow more easily into all those small blood vessels as well as your organs. Your circulation gets better and better instead of worse. You find that wounds, sores, and cuts heal quicker than they ever used to. And as a prize, you get to keep all your toes, both your legs, and both your feet. No amputations necessary. Here's a picture of an ulcer on the foot of a man named Charles. The doctors were discussing amputating his foot. But Charles got serious, eliminated the, most of the carbs in his diet, and his foot began to heal. Today he has both his feet, and both are in good shape. It's amazing what happens to wounds, sores, blisters, ulcers, and so forth when you stop feeding them glucose. Once your blood is free from excess glucose, healing automatically starts to happen. That's it. It's not complicated. It's not difficult. You just have to know what to do and then do it. And the minute your blood sugar levels drop down somewhere close to normal, you can be sure healing is on the way. There is one more thing I need to say about my mother and her story. Her story is sad in the suffering and health issues that plagued her the last 16 years of her life. But in another way, her story is a story of triumph. Although mom went through a lot, she was not alone. She had a husband who loved her and was devoted to her. She had Linda and me, her children, who loved her and stood with her. And she had her grandchildren who also loved her. Mom was loved. And best of all, she loved and was loved by God. She was a follower of Christ and she died in the faith. Health is important, but our life is bigger than our health. Life is really about relationships, a relationship with God and relationships with the people God brings into our lives. And mom had both. And in that, she was greatly blessed.